welcome back to the channel. Um, I know it's been quite a while since I've uploaded pretty much anything at all, actually anything at all. But, uh, obviously, been a little busy, those kinds of things. Now, today, I'm going to be taking on a little bit of an interesting topic. This is more along the lines of a rant, so please don't expect any high level of uh, structure, in all fairness, or a ton of purely fact-based, you know, zero speculation or anything else like that arguments. Uh, unfortunately, those are kind of hard to deliver. Not to say that I'm intentionally being lazy, but I think that the more insight-based stuff is a little more interesting. Also a little more complicating. And gives a little more insight than would a purely stale fact-based thing. At least in this circumstance. Now today what I'm going to be talking about, if the title didn't really clue you in on that, is socialism. Now, with that said, it's not entirely socialism I'm going to be talking about. Um, you see, the idea of us living in this lovely society where everything's taken care of, where we all get to live in peace and prosperity, is something that's dominated uh, basically po government policy for decades, arguably a century now. And quite frankly, over a century actually. But interestingly enough, it's it has some inherent risks. First and foremost, uh, we can trace back the, the ideas of socialism. And actually, before we even do that, once again, I told you this beyond structured, so kind of a little back and forth here. A little bit of going ahead when I'm not supposed to, and going back when I'm not supposed to. But uh, I think it's most important to state why I am essentially conflating socialism and communism together. Obviously, in an academic sense, it's a big no-no. They're two different things. Uh, but this is the problem I have. We go into academics, and we've got this lovely split up of terms and words. For example, welfare capitalism is technically what Canada and the United States have. You know, the welfare state is actually Sweden. A little bit absurd if you ask me, because really, welfare capitalism is what exactly? Capitalism isn't designed to be any form of welfare. Not at all. Not at all, at all, at all. So the fact that we would introduce this term of welfare capitalism is quite frankly absurd. It's almost to a degree of an oxymoron. You know, the welfare part of capitalism is supposed to come from charity, not state-instituted, you know, funding systems, at least in, historically speaking, what was supposed to be capitalism. It's inherently a retarded term, because it's, it's incredibly self-conflating. It doesn't really work. It's an oxymoron in every sense of the word. Or term, actually, in this case. But with that said, it's a word used nonetheless. When in fact, it's more or less a branch of socialism. It's a branch of welfare. Essentially a welfare state. Creating a state that supports its people. Whether it be in times of need, or just 24-7 with the, you know, cradle to grave kind of idea that is present in Sweden, or at least was more so and has become more right-leaning over time, though still radically left in comparison to something like uh, the United States or Canada, who themselves have also been shifting left over time, but are still far lagging behind the radicalism of something like Sweden. Now anyway, back to the main point, once again, this brings point across, which is the fact that these terms and differences are kind of made in theoretics. Oh, take a look at this, that, and the other thing. Oh, but if we use this term here, that does become that, and this doesn't really exist, and this complete freaking mess. There's a reason why socialism and communism are often conflated, and the reason is because the two are almost hand-in-hand -hand the same. In actuality. In actuality, they are pretty much exactly the same thing just a little bit different form. Now, this goes into the line of purely speculation, but 
as you may have noticed, socialism has taken on a new front, particularly with Bernie Sanders. This idea of, you know, democratic socialism. This lovely idea that, you know, it's communism, but better, more free. And I think the reason why socialism has become so popular, even though it's really just a second communism, if you really ask these people their political beliefs, uh, you know, their kind of forefathers, their, you know, political leaders, their political um, intellectuals, shall we say? Their teachers, their professors of this great and amazing ideology of socialism. It's people like Marx, Lenin, and Trotsky, and Mao. It's not some other branch of people. It's communists, <laughs> which really makes you wonder exactly what the heck the intent of socialism really is. And at the end of the day, when you take a look at what these people want and what their end goal is, it's communism. It's not really much of a surprise, even though you'll have the academics come out and say, no, 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 that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. <laughs> or democratic socialism, which is beyond freaking retarded, because guess what? <laughs> In quite a few communist states, there is actually a facade of democracy as well. <laughs> Except for at the end of the day, it either comes down to an oligarchy or an autocracy, meaning essentially you have this pretend say in government, which one could argue happens with current day democracies and republics, but is very evident to any outsider um, in these democratic socialist countries. Um, and that becomes very funny because that was also the idea behind communism. Oh, it's for the people. It's, it's, it's the people's government. Run by a select few, yes, but it's the people. You know, the people still have a say somehow. The people have these rights and this right, and they have this influence. You know, it's a great big thing. It's it's more democratic. It's a people's government. You know, it's for the people of the nation. And this goes very well through with the whole communism, you know, if, terminology and phraseology of things like comrade and a lot of other stuff introduced with kind of this Bolshevik uh, linguistics that are often associated with communist states. And this idea of unity and groups of people, also present in communism, also present in democratic socialism, or at least in theory. Very interesting, considering the two are continually argued to be radically different, even though they tend to argue for the exact same end goal, for the exact same reasons. You know, the oppressed working class. Um, and obviously with the introduction of cultural Marxism, you also have intersectionality, so the poor black people, poor migrant workers, the poor women's, those kinds of things also become introduced into the mix as the other classes involved, not just economic, but also racial and gender-based classes as well. Now, <laughs> having to move on, it's been almost seven minutes, over seven minutes actually, eight minutes now, eight and a half. So this has been going on for quite a while. I'm only getting into things. This might be a while. Now that we've kind of covered the generalities of why these things are similar, we need to take a look at at least my speculation on why socialism is so popular and why communism has kind of gone away. Communism has many lovely poster boys, such as Mao, Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin, and arguably Kim Jong-un, Il and Sung. So, quite frankly, a not very nice lineup. Infamous to say the least, and responsible for millions of people's deaths. Not exactly something you want to be peddling in the United States, where up until recently, communism was not exactly very popular, and arguably still is not. It has a lot of stigma attached to it. And when you take a look at the results of communism, the doctrine of communism, and how it actually works, uh, it's really not much of a surprise. Socialism, on the other hand, is kind of this promise of the freedom that never actually ended up existing in communism. Except for, in reality, it never really comes anyway. But, you know, once again, it's our new and improved communism. It's going to work this time. It's really been the thing, and that's why really is used so often. I'm a socialist, <laughs> is what people will say instead of, I'm a communist, because communist is still a dirty word. You'll find your radicals who are like, yeah, I'm a communist, and I'm a revolutionary, but you'll find your people who are like, no, I'm a socialist, <laughs> which is 
exactly the same thing. You ask these people what they believe in, who their heroes are kind of thing, what they've read. Communist Manifesto. <laughs> you know, Marx. Karl Marx. It's just like, it's the exact same freaking thing. Okay? I don't care what the academic term for socialism is or what the differential is between uh, Leninism and Trotskyism and, you know, Maoism and this and that. It doesn't freaking matter because at the end of the day, these people believe in communism, at least in the way we've identified and termed communism. That's a problem. You have this conflation between the academic world and the real world. <laughs> Unfortunately, the real world actually has actual consequences where millions of people die, and the academic world doesn't have that. But the academic world has the argument of prestige and factuality and grounding and reality, even though it actually doesn't at all. That's kind of the major problem from that. And that's why I find it very important to actually rely more on what is actually real rather than what is claimed in some university sociology textbook. Because quite frankly, it's BS. At least in applicability and usefulness in its entirety. Now, I think it becomes incredibly important to identify why. And once again, this is once again conflating socialism with communism, which I think I've established is remotely fair, at least in this particular uh, commentary. We have Karl Marx. Karl Marx was actually arguably an anarchist, at least originally. He wanted a state that wasn't really a state, that didn't really interfere, he didn't really like governments interfering with uh, civil matters, aka he didn't really like them controlling uh, that kind of stuff. He wanted them interfering with social doctrines. Kind of funny considering uh, socialism, but once again, we're focusing on Marxism here, which is technically communism. At least one form of it. Now, what we have here that's incredibly interesting is, you know, he wanted people sharing and caring, really without much government interference. Once again, you know, no government interference with people's civil lives, aka not really any government regulation or those kinds of things. People will just share on their own. Now, <laughs> for any sane human being, there was a very quick realization that wasn't really possible. By not really possible, I mean not possible at all. And then came the idea of state communism or uh, military communism. This idea that, okay, well, we'll need to state temporarily to get people sharing, and then they'll realize just how great it is, how awesome it is to share and care and, and you know, love each other. They'll realize what a great and effective system it is. Except for, obviously, with the Soviet Union sent testament to that, it is not. And it really didn't work. But once again, that's the theory. And, and then we begin to see the authoritarian, not even tendencies, but requirement of things like communism and socialism, where it's actually required that the state controls and suppresses people in order for it to work. It works no other way. And we know this because Marx, the forefather of this, and every other intellectual who has actually attempted this, has been forced to do exactly just that. You have to do the idea of a utopia. You have to do the thing where you kick people out. Where, in this case, you kill people, you suppress them, you do secret police. These are all inherent to communism. They're also inherent to fascism. But they're inherent to communism and socialism in particular relevance to this. And that should stand testament inherently. On top of that, we need to take a look at one incredibly unfortunate reality, which is now going to socialism. At least the term, not necessarily the idea. The idea is technically, as we've, as I've kind of established, is technically communism, but once again, at least in the context of the conversation. Now we have an unfortunate reality when it comes to socialism. Once again, what does he stand of socialism? Well, if we're comparing to ca communism, which I've said is the same thing in this case, it, the focus is on control of social aspects of human life, not necessarily civil, which automatically makes it incredibly dangerous, because that means it spreads through social interaction, not through civil interaction, not through doctrine or policy, but rather social manifestation. So yes, it can still manifest its form, shall we say, its presence in things like policy, but it's policy regulating not civil issues, but social issues. 
<laughs> what makes social justice incredibly interesting. Because it doesn't focus from a legal standpoint like justice, it focuses from a social standpoint like social justice. But anyway, once again, it leaks into facets of people's life. It doesn't just leak into legislation and policy that no one really gives a crap about. It, it leaks into people's everyday social lives. It, it leaks into the daily conversations, people's political opinions and perspectives, because it focuses on social issues, not just, and actually almost technically not at all, uh, civil issues. That's not what it's concerned with. It's not concerned with those kinds of things. That's for the oligarchy, or for the anarchy that's to ensue later to figure out. The social issues are the important thing for the individual people to understand. They need to understand sharing's good. They don't need to care about what legislation we're enacting for foreign policy. Which, once again, falls back into kind of the past of Marxism. Now, one of the largest issues with socialism is that it preys on people's feelings. If you take a look at where socialism comes from, it comes from fairly depraved societies. Societies that had it really crappy. Even Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf, as insane as he was through almost the text, uh, made a very astute observation and conclusion and analysis of socialism, which was obviously on the rise as well as fascism in Germany, or in particular Austria and Venice, which was the result of the almost laissez-faire uh, capitalism that occurred at the time, with businessmen essentially rejecting every single request for what were fairly legitimate situations where people didn't want to starve to death when they got injured on the job or when they got sick. Basic things that we would consider incredibly reasonable, and were reasonable even at the time, except for these business people didn't want to budge an inch. Once again, these were aristocrats, these were business people, these were people of high stature, um, of privilege, and affluence. And they didn't want to budge an inch because they thought, oh, we budge an inch, and next thing you know, you know, uh, it'll be a collective factory here, and I won't have anything. It just, no, they didn't budge an inch. And that just reinforced the socialists, as Hitler states. It gave them justification for even more insane requests, um, things that weren't reasonable anymore. Um, because they were denying everything. These lazy for capitalists, business people. And that gave the socialists plenty of justification for what they were doing and all these crazy things. Instead of just giving them reasonable things, they completely rejected everything flat out and drove the socialists crazy and gave them a lot of support. And that becomes incredibly interesting because, once again, it preys on people's feels. Oh, well, we just want this one reasonable thing. And then it goes from, well, we want the ability not to die when we get sick or get injured on the job. You know, we want basic support and, you know, chance at, you know, employment insurance kind of thing. Which is, let's be clear, reasonable. Even Adolf Hitler thought, thought that to be reasonable in Mein Kampf. But then went from that to like, oh, well, we want a communist state. Well, where the frick did that come from? And this is how communism works. Oh, well, we want reasonable things. We just want reasonable common sense gun control. We just want reasonable common sense you know, welfare and public support for the poor and the homeless and these kinds of things, and it just explodes into this gigantic thing. And that's why the socialism movement in places like Austria began to really take on traction, because the socialists had a lot of support, because they weren't budging an edge, the uh, laissez-faire capitalists, and it preyed on people's feelings. And one of the largest problems with socialism when the grand plan is revealed, when, you know, oh, but we've got enough resources here and there, we make enough money here and there, is that it relies on the false facet of capitalism. Capitalism creates this idea of abundance because it is, even according to Karl Marx, the most efficient system ever devised by humanity. But Karl Marx's argument was, efficiency isn't everything. Efficiency isn't the pinnacle of human innovation. No, 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 no. It's morality. It's, you know, how we can help the poorest of the poor. You know, kind of thing. It's how we make sure no one falls behind. It turns out by making everyone fall behind, but that's beyond the point. Reality is, is this idea came in. And unfortunately, most people ignore that. Marx knew that communism was not going to be as big and as great as capitalism. By default, because he accredited capitalism with being far more efficient. 
Unfortunately, modern-day Marxists, communists, and socialists tend to be under the assumption that, oh, we'll take a look at all these excess goods and resources, we can just give them to people. Yeah, that's under a capitalist system. What happens when you take that all to government regulation? All that extra stuff goes away. It's not even produced besides, you know, mismanaged by the government. It's not even produced. It's this idea that the current status quo by capitalism that is created by extreme efficiency will somehow exist when you bring in big bureaucracy, which is beyond retarded. And that's why you get things like food shortages, famines, inefficiency, those kinds of things, which existed within the Soviet Union, in particular where they were building massive stadiums and these other lovely kinds of things, and people were without housing in parts of Russia. Mismanagement, to say the least. A sign of inefficiency, to say the least. But what's the assumption when things first start off? Oh, well, you know, we're going to have all the same efficiencies as capitalism, for some reason, um, just with government management, which never works. It just, it doesn't. Government has different responsibilities than does a private business, whose sole focus is on efficiency and capital gain. Government is not so much the same. Its job is to spend other people's money. And when it does so effectively and efficiently, in respect to what can be expected of a government, it does well. But you give it too big of a job, and it tends not to work so well. That's just the inherencies of how things work. And one of the short sights of socialism is that it doesn't realize that. It just assumes that the same efficiencies of capitalism will exist, even though capitalism is recognized as being far more efficient, but ruthlessly efficient. And that's where these issues come from. Now, if we focus on one last lovely thing, and that is, why is socialism is really just not great at all. And that's that it just simply doesn't work, as has been probably well established through this whole thing. It socially manipulates people because it preys on our loving side. It preys on our side of empathy. You know, we don't want to see the person starving in the streets. Even, even Friedman was just like, yeah, no, even in capitalist society, we don't want people starving and dying in the streets. It's horrible. It's inhumane. It's immoral in every sense of the word. However, you don't achieve that in a communist system. You don't get rid of that. Not at all. Actually, arguably, you create it en masse. Because you get rid of the efficiency that supported 98% of the population and <laughs> make it so that none of the population has it. And it's funny, because I remember this one quote. I can't remember who to actually assign the quote to, but, you know, communism... Sorry, capitalism is the idea that, you know, the man screws over man, <laughs> and the idea of communism is that the situation is reversed. <laughs> people just screw over each other, and it's just endless. It doesn't really go away. The question is, is how are you going to screw over people? Are you going to screw over people unintentionally through capitalism, where things are just by competition, you know, that's how you lose, or win? Or is it going to be through communism, where the state enforces it, and where things are kind of pre-planned, and there's a conscious effort made for these things to occur? That's the question. And at the end of the day, it needs to be answered. And oftentimes it's not. This is why it becomes incredibly dangerous, because this is where we begin to see that communism has a problem. Now what happens when we scale back communism and socialism? Let's say Keynesian economics. Lovely thing that really took hold, kind of existed until around the 1960s, 1970s, where it fell out of favor, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were kind of like, nope, we're not doing that anymore, because we're not going to spend our way out of debt, because that's insane. And it doesn't work. <laughs> Just so happens, it probably doesn't work. Not even in the case of World War II, which was arguably the world's largest spending project, with, I think, 90 million or 90 billion dollars. I don't remember. I also don't remember the inflation rate, but regardless, a crap ton of money. Arguably didn't even, you know, pull the world out of uh, inflation. It just happened naturally. And here's the problem. We indefinitely so have a capitalist system in the Western world, whether you like it or not, whether or not socialism kind of embanks on it, or corporatism kind of embanks on it, or really dominates it, um, we still have a baseline of capitalist system. The market's designed to fluctuate, it's designed to move, there's boom and bust cycle, as in the words of Adam Smith, the invisible hand guides uh, market demand. 
those lovely kinds of things. Now, what's the fun issue is what happens when you try and introduce socialism to the mix? What happens then? You know, when you introduce the government to keep things nice and stable, to get rid of those nasty busts, you know, so we don't have any more of those nasty Great Depressions, those other kinds of things. And what happens when we give the government far more control? We encourage the government to spend, you know, in times of despair, and save in times of greatness. Well, first and foremost, if there's anything wrong with that statement I just made, it should probably be the bit where I say, save money. The government <laughs> doesn't really do a lot of that inherently. They'd probably like to be reelected. If they've got tons of money and the people are going through their financial plan, it's like, well, you've got a surplus of, like, whatever million dollars. Why aren't you spending it? I'm, you know... I'd like free this, free that, and free the other thing. Why aren't you giving it to me? I'm not electing you. I'm going to elect the guy who's going to promise me to spend it. Ta-da! <laughs> you know, people don't like increased taxation, those kinds of things. You're not getting re-elected if you do that during a boom. No one's going to re-elect you. The problem that Keynes identified with Keynesian economics is that it doesn't really work that well in a free society. It really only works in authoritarian society as stated by Keynes himself. Minor details when introducing it to the Western world. On top of that, by minor addition, is the fact of something called stagflation. If you thought inflation and deflation were bad, try stagflation. <laughs> Which the world found out the freaking hard way. It turns out, by the 1960s, when Keynes in economics was kind of in a little bit more full swing, and arguably actually entering its dying years, which would finally conclude at the end of 19, the 1970s uh, through Margaret and Thatcher, you know, and Reagan economics, trickle-down kind of thing, very more so conservative, you know, swing back to the right. Uh, you had labor unions becoming increasingly militant. The funny thing about human behavior is that people become complacent very quickly. Oh, well, the employment rate's like 98%. Oh, well, the market isn't fluctuating at all, as it hasn't been for years now. Because of Keynesian economics. Well, now we can get a little bit harsh on the, uh... I gotta crack the knuckles here. A little bit harsh on the, uh... Work, um, wages. You know, we can now start arguing for higher prices, because what are you gonna do, fire us? <laughs> we don't fear unemployment. You know, unemployment's at, like, what? An insanely high rate now. If that's not a problem anymore. You know, we can make you completely uncompetitive. That's exactly what happened. 1960s, labor unions became increasingly militant. Increasingly militant. Because they had no fear. They became complacent. And then you enter stagflation. When the market wasn't fluctuating, things kind of just did the same thing and nothing really happened. And the system eventually ended up screwing itself because of that. A fun side effect. Because when you introduce socialism into a capitalist system, it screws it up. Its normal motion of up and down, boom and bust, goes away. Unless the system doesn't work. Turns out boom and bust are actually inherent to capitalism. Inherent to our capitalist system. And when you take that away with Keynesian economics and try to stabilize it with socialist ideology, it doesn't freaking work actually breaks the thing, which is what it did. We stagflation, which is, turns out worse than inflation. Who knew? Now, that kind of concludes things here, which is the fact that if it hasn't become evident through this uh, kind of rambling rant, is that leftist ideology like socialism and communism are not just incompatible with the free world, but incompatible with our current system. It actually damages the system, makes it more ineffective, and actually creates the worst of both worlds, rather than the best of both worlds. And I think that's what's incredibly important, because that's the current driving factor of things like socialism and communism, and why we, why everyone argues we should need them, which is that, oh, we'll get the best of both worlds. No, you don't. You get the worst of both worlds. You create complacency where it shouldn't be, and you create stability where it shouldn't be, and then you create competition where it shouldn't be. Or arguably lack thereof. Now, with that said, hopefully in conclusion, you hopefully... You found this actually remotely useful. This is obviously a bit of a crazed rant. I'm also, for some reason, a little bit out of breath today. So if you hear a lot of that, sorry. Um, I'll try to kind of edit that out with sound bad, but, you know, sound wave bad editor, but, yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed. 
If you like what I do, thank you. If you don't, let me know what I could do to improve, which is probably a lot, but yeah. I'm kind of a one-man show. Anyway, hope you have a great day, night, whatever, and uh, yeah, signing off.